we go through all these things and talk about all these problems with the annoying sounds and you know how important it is for the bellows sounds to be informative and all this it just harkens back to the point where the essential goal here of these so-called auditory alarms isn't to alarm it's to notify and i think mm-hmm. if we can use better sounds like that whether it's those bellow sounds or some of the ones that judy came up with for the new standards we can accomplish the same goal which is communication and notification without the annoyance welcome to audio branding the hidden gem of marketing Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. This is the second part of our discussion in the Power of Sound Club on Clubhouse about sound in healthcare. Alarms are killing us obviously based on hospital to hospital and depending on how new the hospital is. It's, it, you know, it's kind of like when people design sound for uh, a um, home unit like Google Home as opposed to their phone, as opposed to their computer with speakers. There's a different sound that comes out and it can be harsher or not depending on the environment. So yeah, it's, um, it's a lot of considerations. And uh, there's a lot that goes into that, I'm sure. Mike, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, sure. So like, one of the things that I think about a lot is I think we've talked about terminology in a couple of contexts. And I think, actually, the whole terminology that we use for this sort of sets up the wrong idea about alarm design, because really, we call them alarms. But for the most part, I don't think they're actually intended to be alarming in these medical devices. So fire alarms are supposed to be alarming because their purpose is to get you out of the building. But for most of these devices, like you've heard, we're hearing hundreds of these per patient per day. And most of them actually don't mean something critical needs to happen. And so those aren't really false alarms. Like if the blood pressure alarm goes off, Joe knows more about this, but you know, if your blood pressure goes out of range, then the blood pressure alarm might go off, not to indicate something terrible is happening, but just to correctly indicate the pressure has gone out of range. So the purpose isn't to alarm, but just to inform or to alert or to notify. And so I think that naming is important because when we're designing them, the point of these is to notify and to update, not necessarily to alarm everyone. And I think part of the reason why we've stuck with some of these terrible sounds is that, well, if it's called an alarm, it seems like a manufacturer's thinking it should be alarming. And so I know one of the things Judy was doing with the revisions to the standards was coming up with a range of sounds that don't all sound terrible because sometimes their purpose is just to inform. And so I think that's important to keep in mind because the solution here isn't just to get rid of the alarms or to turn them down or have fewer of them, but it's to design them in a way that we can hear lots of them uh, throughout the day without them being so, you know, grating and so terrible sounding. Thanks so much for that. Yeah. Um, so just renaming them might solve the problem. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, we, well, not just uh, well, just, not like, the only uh, thing, the men- but yeah. <laughs> yeah, the mentality of like, I get this feedback a lot. I'm mm-hmm. curious if other people do too, about, you know, talking about this and hear these sound better. And people say, well, if it's an alarm, shouldn't it sound alarming? Or if something is really going wrong in the hospital, it should sound bad because I want the doctor, you know, to stop what they're doing and attend to that. Uh, but then when you talk to doctors, like, Joe will say, it's not like I'm not listening or not paying attention. Like I'm listening very intensely. And so he's done some work showing that you can actually hear these things, even when they're softer than you would expect. And because the doctors are really trained to pick up on that. So I think it's important to keep in mind because the solution here isn't just to make it stick out more or make it more alerting. The solution here is to come up with a way of designing the sound so that we can use it for the purpose. And the purpose here, the way I see it, is more often to notify than to alarm. If it's one that's going off, like when a patient is about to have a very serious episode and perhaps, you know, pass away if something isn't done, then that should be like a terrible sound. (laughs) If I were in the hospital and that were the situation, I would be all for the worst possible sound at that moment. Uh, But most of these aren't of that nature. And that's where I think the problem with thinking about them as alarms is an issue. And it's really more thinking about them as notifications that's more effective. Sure. And differentiation between sounds might be a good idea. Being able to tell the the immediate difference. If you're in that environment, I'm sure that you're aware (laughs) that something is more serious than another thing because of the sound that it makes. But yeah, the the ones that are less alarming and more informative could definitely 
do with sounding a little better. <laughs> uh, we do have a question from our audience here, Andrea Petrude, and I think that's how you pronounce your last name. I'm not sure. I hope I got it right. Uh, she asks, do hospitals and manufacturers care about certi certification or acknowledgements? If so, are there ways of stimulating higher standards and care for patients and nurses' medical teams so they are more interested in change? Do any of you want to weigh in on that? Um, I would ask, uh, Andrew, for more clarification. Do you mean like from LeapFrog or U.S. News and World Report? What do you mean by certifications? Uh, if you want to, I mean, you're welcome to come up on stage if you want to ask and clarify yourself, Andrea, but uh, you can also write in the room chat. We're happy to, I'm happy to relay your message. <laughs> uh, oh, like stars for hotels. Okay. Yeah. So are there hospitals that get stars? I mean... <laughs> Is that how that works? Yeah, no, um, when, and, and we get ranked. Sorry, um, you can go ahead, Ayo. No, no, Joe, just go ahead. I, because um, my uh, example will not be about hospitals, but I'll go after you. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, hospitals get ranked, you know, in the U.S., I was asking, like, U.S. News and World Report or things like that. You know, hospitals get ranked on quality metrics and quantity metrics, too, if you look at, like, NIH funding and things like that. But we also get ranked, you know, whenever you have an anesthetic from me, you will get emailed a survey and you can fill it out. And there's also a place for a voice recording. So, um, you know, you Google us and it's like healthgrades.com and there's a few other ones. So, um, you know, we have wanted to do that or the hospitals have wanted to do that because you do have a choice. It is it is a business. You know, in Nashville, we're a mile away from Centennial Hospital, HCA's flagship hospital. And by a society, you know, you'll get much better care at Vanderbilt. But, you know, I'm sure people have different experiences, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Elif. Um, Actually, there is an UK-based um, organization, and uh, they quiet mark uh, your products. And this can also be architectural space. So there, there needs to be some measurements done and, you know, it needs to comply with the quietness. So when you get this quiet mark, that is kind of a certification that actually you did care about, you know, the, the auditory quality of your uh, hospital and uh, not only hospital, but so you can quiet mark your um, water cooker or you can quiet mark your refrigerator as a manufacturer so when you get this quiet marks uh, it's a certification that you know you really your engineering solutions paid off and your your, your um, uh, people m might prefer your product over others and I think uh, it's also a good incentive for hospitals actually to start getting these quiet marks and uh, we did think about doing it for the Erasmus Medical Center but uh, COVID happened and <laughs> we never got around uh, to doing it. But I think that could also be a nice incentive. So um, why don't we, you know, award uh, good efforts on the sound quality? Yeah, really interesting. Uh, you know, there's one question that I would ask, and I know that um, when it comes to sound design, there are certain items, certain things that we buy that we expect to be noisy. And so I wonder if people are in a hospital that's very quiet, if they're going to feel like they're not getting the best care. I wonder if that's something that we have conditioned them to expect, that noise. What do you guys think? Um, I think that it's it's this is completely embedded in our culture. And what I usually give an, as an example, we expect things to make a noise and we, we have very particular expectations about alarms. And, you know, like in whatever that film was called with Matt Damon, he went to Mars, right? And he, um, he, can, he can survive and he can do this and he can do all these wonderful things. But when, there's a, when there was a storm, the, the, um, the spaceship just beeped in the same old way that, you know, badly, basically. Um, we, we, uh, it's almost... The hospital alarms are almost a soundtrack to medical care, so I think I think this kind of noise has, has literally become a soundtrack to 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 being in a hospital, and you can't really you know you we can't think beyond that. We we expect to hear these sounds, um, and um, I'm very much against using uh, having lots of noise and lots of sound. Um, and Joe Joe's done some lovely studies where he's shown that. Um, 
your alarms don't need to actually be very loud and if they are it's actually not helpful at all they don't need to be the loudest thing in the environment but it's it's completely embedded in our culture this whole idea that pieces of equipment have to make a lot of noise and alarms have to be really loud and they have to sound a certain way um it's, it's actually culturally really interesting yeah, I've been doing some research myself on things like, I don't know, leaf blowers, uh, vacuum cleaners, <laughs> you know, these things are loud, and they don't need to be really anymore. But if they're not loud, we don't think they're working. <laughs> so go ahead, Joe, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, so, um, well, thank you for the nice compliment, Judy. And uh, your comment just now, Jody, about things being loud. Um so we have these new anesthesia machines that the ventilator doesn't require the bellows to go up and down. So when you think of a ventilator, classically, the thought is that swooshing sound, and that sound was generated from the old bellows of a ventilator. Well, now, the new technology, you don't need that. So they're actually silent. But anesthesiologists started to think that the anesthesia machine wasn't functioning because they didn't hear the bellows sound, the swooshing sound. So the companies added a recording of the bellows when the ventilator was on so the anesthesiologist knew that it was working now that's not a loud annoying sound but we needed to hear that sound otherwise we started to get uh, nervous and then a real life example as judy was saying about do do the sound need to be loud and annoying to be perceived and so a good real life thing to think about is wherever anyone is right now, but let's say you're in some room, home, office, whatever. If someone down the hall were to scream and it wasn't loud, but you could hear it so you could perceive it, what would you do? And you would have a reflexive alerting mechanism to that. And that's because the human scream has this acoustic feature called roughness. And there's a researcher in Montreal Robert Satori, who did a lot of uh, research into that and doing brain scans and things like that. But we have a reflexive writing attentional draw to that. And only tertiary processing does it tell us, hey, that's a human scream. So it doesn't have to be loud for us to alert and change our attentional shift. And so, you know, it just shows in, in real life with ecological validity, things don't need to be loud and annoying. I know that we're all dealing with a lot of stuff these days, so I particularly wanted to acknowledge those that have taken the time to leave honest reviews of this podcast. Skyle Renee, I think it's Renee, it's spelled R-E-N-E, so that's what I'm going to go with. I hope I got it right. Had this to say. Worth it. This podcast is so good that I just want to sit and stay in my car a little longer. Thanks, Jody. You're very welcome, Skyle. And thank you so much for taking the time to write a review. Now, back to the show. Yeah, very good point. And I know that the issue with electric cars is the same as the one for anesthesiologists, Joe. <laughs> They've well, that, added that's the right. sounds. And, then, and that initial work with the Nissan Leaf was actually done in the anechoic chamber at Vanderbilt, where mm -hmm. with a ring of speakers, it was looking at where does the car turn versus go straight in front of you? How much sound is needed to perceive that when you look at visual or hearing impaired and so there was actually sound added to the Nissan Leaf. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, uh, a lot of parents were using their cars to soothe their children to sleep, right? They were driving around the neighborhood when the baby wouldn't go to sleep. <laughs> it was being soothed by the sounds of the car. And when the car was no longer making those sounds, uh, Nissan went ahead and made a, a kind of playlist on Spotify that parents could play in the car <laughs> instead of having the car itself making the sound, it was coming from the speakers. <laughs> yeah, and well, and so even my car, I have a uh, Honda Insight and it's a hybrid and it's so quiet when it reverses, there's this like angelic kind of singing choral sound that comes out of the car. And the first time I drove it, you know, it's like, what's going on? Because I can hear it as the driver. And then I, I got my tires rotated and, and the mechanics would purposely reverse my car because they like this like angelic choral sound, but it's the same type of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's amazing what we can do with sound, but it's it's strange when it disappears, I guess. <laughs> Go ahead, Ellen. Okay. Yeah, I have a nice story 
uh, that we uh, we did a research about two years ago with the local hospital uh, here in Delft, and um, and it was a sound study, sound and sleep study. So we uh, they said, well, our uh, patients. So it's a it's a general ward. It's not ICU. There's co-sleeping. There are co-sleeping uh, patients. That, you know, four in one room. Um, they said that you know they they want to improve the uh, the sleeping experience of the patients and how can we do what what can we do with sound design and how can we help them? And what we found out was actually it was too quiet the uh, these uh, wards. So in the absence of sound, what was bothering you know uh, the the patients was snoring sounds. And the uh, beds uh, rustling, you know, this uh, duvet uh, uh, that when you move, uh, you, know, you create this rustling sound, coughing or sneezing, and uh, or someone going to the toilet, and you hear the liquid sounds from coming from the toilet. <laughs> so then, what was left was actually all these human-made sounds, and like um, Judy was saying, that we are not used to it. And then they start becoming annoying. And we were thinking, what can we do in such situations? Because then you also need to mask these sounds, human-made sounds, by perhaps adding other kinds of sounds during, you know, between 9.30 and 11, uh, when uh, uh, you want patients to fall asleep. Could we add some music? Or Because falling asleep is a issue. Uh, waking up from sleep was not that much uh, of an issue. You know, then it's interesting. Then the sound design uh, uh, also takes a different turn because, um, yeah, you want to you want to take care of the human made sounds. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess white noise would help in that aspect. I know that uh, sometimes people will put will put on a fan <laughs> just to mask uh, other noises that they don't want to hear. So, yeah, it's uh, we humans are strange. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's a there's a lot that goes into the whole sound design of uh, a hospital if and when you actually go into that minutia. But Andrea has another question here uh, asking about whether the doctors and nurses are really interested in these changes. And I'm wondering, Joe, if that's something that, that you're seeing firsthand. Are, are the people you work with interested in these changes or they're just they're just blase about it staying the way it is? No, so they actually very much are. And one thing I pride myself on and, and our group on is the participants in my study are actually practicing clinicians. A lot of uh, research in this area is the participants are undergrad students. Undergrad students are obviously easier to recruit than practicing clinicians, but I wanted to use actual real end users. And when they come and they participate 99 plus percent of the time, they'll make a comment to me like thank god someone is actually doing this work and um so they're huge proponents of it and absolutely i I really haven't even run into anyone who uh has negativity towards our work interesting anyone else want to weigh in on that i mean that's from participants you know some some journal reviewers some journal reviewers might but (laughs) that's a different thing they're not actually working there 24 hours (laughs) So yeah, um, yeah. Um, go ahead. Just for maybe uh, quickly, yeah, they are very interested. And um, uh, but one of the things that we found out is uh, there are also individual factors that we have to consider. Um, not only that, you know, the manufacturers and the devices that are being designed, um, uh, nurses, for example, also interact with these products in their own way, and there may be um, sensitivities to sound, uh, their musicality, uh, or their way of being, like personality, if you're nonchalant, or if you're more neurotic, uh, they will all uh, also um, uh, influenced the way they set, for example, alarm limits. We are investigating this in the in a PhD project, also together with Philips Healthcare, and uh, so it's important that yes, they are interested, but we also need to understand them and maybe uh, try to categorize these uh, different types of uh, caregivers and and understand because we can't obviously design for individual cases, but there are commonalities definitely and. Uh, so important to, you know, pay attention to that as well. 
Sure. And that might lead certain practitioners to go to certain hospitals if they have certain soundscapes. <laughs> I mean, if, yeah, if they cater to a, a certain uh, neurotype, I guess, then yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, uh, um, I mean, people can be grouped in a certain way because there are also cultural issues and how they interact with sound or how much noise do they make themselves. And, um, uh, you know, maybe different units will also have different uh, ways of uh, auditorily being, you know, or, uh, or being sound conscious. Uh, so, yeah, why not? I mean, we want people to get the most out of their work and that they are also happy. Maybe there's some um, uh, room for that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point. We have a question in the room chat here from Connor Wessel, who asks, in cases where we can remove mechanical sounds, such as bellows from a respirator, would people feel assured if it produced a different, more pleasant sound rather than its original sound? What do you think on that? You know, I, I don't think so because it has, you know, an ecological validity. It's that mechanical. We're just so used to hearing it. So if if you're creating a new sound, you know, maybe through focus group, et cetera, as, as work like ALF does, it's user-centered design. But, uh, you know, the, the, the bellows is not a bad sound. And so, um, you know, I, I, I'm not bothered by it. I, I'm perfectly happy hearing the bellows. But I think, you know, then it just gets into, as Judy was saying, when you think of design as, as the aesthetics, you know, you're going to ask 100 people, you might get 100 different answers. We, we don't want people to dislike our design, but we're not necessarily thinking about if, you know, everybody loves it because that, that gets chaotic to design things that way too. So personally, you know, my, my bias is um, I think it's perfectly acceptable to keep the bellows. So. Sure. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that? <laughs> well, uh, Connor's touching on a very interesting point here. And, um, it's of course it's really relevant to electronic vehicles as well. You know, do you replace the sound with a, the sound of a different car, or what you think that car would sound like, or uh, do you replace do you replace it with a, a different sound altogether that might be more pleasant? I mean, it's a it's an interesting question in terms of because uh, of course we can make any sound we want these days, so it's opened up a whole new sphere of research for us researchers on the uh, alarm sounds and alarm sound because we can make almost we can make literally any sound and the match between the sound and its function is a is, is a whole research area that's really quite exciting so it's a it's a it's, a, it's an interesting question and it, it's a, there's a lot to it yeah very much so and and i think that there are there's something to be said for people getting comfortable with sounds that they are familiar with so I mean, that's why we recreate the sound of a car <laughs> in a car that doesn't need to make those sounds anymore um, or, you know, recreate the sound of the bellows in the respirator. So I, I think that there's something to be said for the comfort that we get from hearing those sounds and from having experienced them for so long, even if they don't have to be there anymore. I mean, when you take a picture on your phone, it clicks. Does it need to? No. <laughs> but it gives you an indication you just took a picture. <laughs> so we need to hear these these things, I guess, to comfort us, to make us aware that we did something or, you know, just to, to let us know the triggers that have happened. Are you looking for ways to improve your company's or podcast's impact? You'd be surprised how powerful the use of an intentional audio branding strategy can be. Want to know more? I have a free downloadable PDF that gives you my five tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy at voiceoversandvocals.com slash audio dash branding dash strategy. That location does ask to put you on a mailing list just to send you updates on when the new podcasts come out. But if you really don't want to give your email out, I understand. Just contact me directly. My email is all over my website and I'll make sure you get that PDF without needing to sign up anywhere. If you do sign up, though, you also get access to a resources section called The Studio, where I have videos, white papers and PDFs, discounts from my guests, and snippets of audio from my guests that no one else gets to hear. So maybe it's worth your while. Totally up to you. And of course, if you're looking for voiceovers, you can get in touch with me about that, too. Now, back to the podcast. 
there is so much more to talk about this, but we have about four minutes left. And uh, we just got a question from Max Del Grazi. And uh, he says, in that case, can we use mechanical sounds that are mechanical in nature? Like, for example, can an alarm notifying that a patient needs oxygen sound like a respirator? That's interesting. Right. Well, I, yes. Well, um, Max has uh, in, possibly inadvertently hit on what, uh, what the sounds are like in a new standard. That's it, exactly what we've done. We've made the sounds... Uh, much more iconic and much more like their functions. So indeed, our, our, the new sound in the standard for oxygen uh, is a breathing, is um, well, the ventilation sound is a breathing sound um, with some adaptation and the oxygen sound is a kind of bubbling sound. So we've, we have, uh, that's exactly the approach we've taken. Yes, you can do that. And indeed we have. Wonderful, yeah. And so I would say not, not only have we done that, but we've shown benefit and uh, in shameless self-promotion, Max, uh, Judy's in my papers in the Journal of Medical Systems showing that. Wonderful. Yeah. There's a lot more that can be discussed about this, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but I, I did want to ask if any of you have opinions on how hospitals could actually sound like a healing environment. Do you have any uh, particular thoughts on that aspect of things? Uh, Mike, I'd like to get to you, actually, because we haven't heard from you in a while. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, sorry. I was just enjoying hearing everyone else's uh, perspectives there. That's okay. Yeah. So I'm actually probably the wrong one to talk to about the hospitals as a healing environment because I've my involvement has really just been on trying to design the better sounds. Um, so I just think the bottom line, not to sound like a broken record, is when we go through all these things and talk about all these problems with the annoying sounds and you know how important it is for the bellows sounds to be informative and all this it just harkens back to the point where the essential goal here of these so-called auditory alarms isn't to alarm it's to notify and i think mm -hmm. if we can use better sounds like that whether it's those bellows sounds or some of the ones that judy came up with for the new standards we can accomplish the same goal which is communication and notification without the annoyance and so i think historically the two were linked together and so the more we can decouple them, the better we can make the healthcare environment and the more pleasant uh, and better recovery we'll see with the patients. Very good point. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, and I wanted to add, when, when I walk to work, I'm an adult practitioner, but I walk through the children's hospital, get to the adult hospital. And when I walk in the children's hospital, the uh, colors are soft. There's these art installations on the ceiling, which actually absorb ambient sound. There's this thing called a butterfly garden where it's their wooden butterflies, but you can turn them and they have this just aesthetically pleasing look. So it's we talked about sound design, but there's also the physical design of the uh, visual space and just the environmental physical space. And then I get to the adult hospital, I'm not saying ours is drab or anything, but it just seems like the physical space of a children's hospital, children's hospitals, tend to be a little bit more intentional and thoughtfully designed than uh, the big kids hospital. Yeah, that's interesting and unfortunate. Go ahead, Elif. <laughs> um, there's uh, one PhD uh, project that we are working on actually now together again with uh, Philips Healthcare. We are trying to understand how can sounds, um, added sounds, not, you know, sounds of the machinery or um, uh, alarms, uh, actually added new sounds um, can alter the perception of the soundscapes and even tackle uh, fundamental uh, human needs such as need for comfort, need for beauty, need for recognition or um, need for connection. Um, I think it's very interesting also to look at soundscapes of the future hospitals from the patient perspective too. Um, because um, while maybe the clinicians are equipped to deal with it because it's their working environment and they use sounds functionally, like Joe said, you know, he doesn't care what the uh, mechanical ventilator sounds like. He's, you know, he doesn't have to have them as beautiful. But patients, they do need some kind of comfort and familiarity and, and some emotional support as well. So f looking at it from their perspective too uh, will help improve you know the aesthetic quality of the of the hospitals as well i mean at least that's uh, where we are getting at or we are, we are working towards and maybe in five years we have some examples <laughs> what it can sound like but sure. i don't think these things you know change overnight 
No, you're right. Yeah. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I know we're out of time, but just to wrap up on on that, you know, these uh, we because we've circled back a lot to these bellow sounds, but as a reminder, these aren't the anesthesia machines. So if I've if I've done my job, you're not going to remember the sound. Uh, that's a good point, <laughs> and a good one to end on. I think. <laughs> Let's hope that we don't hear those sounds. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate all of my panelists and, and your huge amount of knowledge that you've shared with us today. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who has come here to listen and participate in the chat and ask questions. And uh, yeah, I hope that we will do this again sometime soon. And I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.